I gotta be honest with you, this is an episode about climate change, so it's just gonna be super depressing. Actually, Storm, aka Aurora Monroe, has been a leader of the X-Men since Giant Size X-Men number one in 1975. She's been married to Black Panther, so she's been the queen of Wakanda. Storm's mutant superpower is that she can control the weather. I command the Sahara winds! Transform this ice to steam! I really, really wish that Storm actually existed in real life, because in the comics, Storm uses her superpowers to save people from hurricanes and floods and forest fires. A war of rain to quench the flames! She fights off invasive species like the brood and she protects the endangered. She can prevent droughts and famines. She protects refugees. She fends off brainwashing. Well, now it's like climate hysteria. And stops plagues from getting unleashed. What's wrong? Got a touch of the plague. Get her off of him. <sighs> and she fights racism. The first time that she meets Black Panther is when she's saving him from a gang of apartheid soldiers. You fit? In real life, all of those problems that I mentioned are getting a lot worse because of climate change. Climate change is one of those issues that's so big that most of us fantasize that somebody else is going to figure out a way to fix it, right? Or we try to just not think about it. Well, some people are thinking about it. This is an episode about geoengineering. Could scientists actually control the weather? Idea number one, make more clouds. Obviously, with global warming, if we had more shade, it wouldn't be so hot, right? So what if we took a bunch of hoses and attached them to blimps and pumped sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere? Why do engineers think this might work? Well, every time there's a major volcanic eruption, it puts sulfur dioxide into that upper atmosphere. And every time that happens, it really does lower the global average temperatures. There are some drawbacks, though. Volcanologists can pinpoint the date of every major volcanic eruption going back thousands and thousands of years. And Egypt has been keeping track of the water level of the Nile for thousands and thousands of years because they've always used it to irrigate their crops. So we know for a fact that every major volcanic eruption results in droughts and famine. Uh, uh. From the sun, a constant stream of radiant energy pours down through the atmosphere. At the Earth's surface, this radiant energy is converted into heat energy. And it evaporates water. It forms clouds. And so, eventually, the rains come. Even if we just experiment over one country, we really can't predict whose crops are going to dry out and die. We can't predict who's going to starve to death or what species we're going to kill. And if we cloud seed enough to reliably counteract the warming temperatures, we are guaranteed to kill millions of people and make a bunch of species go extinct. So cloud seeding is not going to work. Okay, so uh, what about option number two? Uh, plant more plants. If the main greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide, and plants take in carbon dioxide to grow, then that seems like a great option, right? To do this at the scale required would mean that we would have to transform huge swaths of the earth into forests. That means pumping a lot of water. Fresh water is already scarce, and it takes a ton of electricity to move that much water. Where's that electricity gonna come from? Maybe fossil fuels or generating more nuclear waste? And then who has to move out of the way to make room for all these forests? But okay, I'm not fully ready to abandon this idea because we could also grow plants in the ocean, right? I'm talking about algae, phytoplankton. We could dump fertilizer in the ocean, thus increasing the amount of phytoplankton, thus decreasing the amount of carbon in the air. Iron would probably be the most efficient because in a phytoplankton cell, for every one iron atom, there's 1.06 million carbon atoms. So, in theory, iron could give us a 1.06 million fold increase per atom via algae capturing that carbon. But 
Even in ideal laboratory conditions, the iron uptake is an infinitesimal fraction. So we would have to dump an enormous amount of iron into the ocean. Almost all of it wouldn't go towards algae growth. And the rest of that iron, we don't really know what the side effects would be. But for argument's sake, let's say that we could get the fertilizer just right to increase the amount of algae in the ocean. Well, we'd probably get toxic dead zones like this one. Florida's governor declaring a state of emergency in four counties. To deal with the toxic algae bloom that's killing fish and ruining the coastline, lakes and rivers. The water is chock full of chemicals and nutrients, much of it runoff from commercial agriculture and sprawling development. When that mix bakes in the summer sun, the algae population explodes. The toxins the cyanobacteria produce are incredibly potent. They affect liver function. There's neurotoxins that they, they produce can kill wildlife and really impact people's health. It smells like rotten egg. It interferes with your breathing. It's an absolute embarrassment. And once it starts to cover up a waterway like this, it deprives it of oxygen, essentially sucking the life out of it. Wildlife like manatees can choke to death, but underwater, the entire marine ecosystem is at risk. The phytoplankton blocks sunlight from plants that are underwater and that has a chain reaction that just kills off whole ecosystems. Then when the algae dies, the bacteria that decomposes the algae releases a ton of methane and nitrous oxide, which are greenhouse gases. Some types of phytoplankton put sulfates into the atmosphere, which could be good, like maybe that would increase the cloud cover, which would cool down the planet. But if we do this too much, we get that problem again where we kill a bunch of people from droughts. Okay, let's move on to geoengineering option number three, machines that just suck carbon out of the air. Direct air capture contraptions uh, basically work like artificial trees. They filter air and suck out the carbon. Uh, here on top, you see the plastic material which absorbs the CO2. Claus Lackner of Columbia University says that his prototype is a thousand times more effective at scrubbing carbon than a tree of the same size. David Keith built a prototype that's about four feet wide by 20 feet tall. There are working prototypes right now operating in Canada, Switzerland, and Iceland. The chemistry is described here, and I'll link to that, but maybe you can guess where I'm going with this. The math just doesn't work out. See, the average American produces 20 tons of carbon dioxide every year. So every single one of us in the United States would need one of these 20 foot tall machines running 24 seven. And it uses about twice as much electricity as a refrigerator. Where's that electricity gonna come from if most of our energy is still coming from oil and gas and coal? This isn't a way to outrun the problem. It's not even a way to keep running in place. It just puts us farther and farther behind. This is also the most expensive option on the geoengineering menu by far. And if we wanted to put these carbon scrubbing machines all over the planet, that would cost so much money that would be better spent on transitioning to cleaner energy sources. If you watch this episode hoping to learn about some techno fix that's gonna swoop in and save us from climate change. The forecast was for sunny skies. Oh. That's uh, science fiction. I'm sorry. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Because the fossil fuel industry has an enormous financial incentive to figure this one out in order to continue business as usual. They don't want to be regulated. They don't want to lose market share to renewable energy sources. Nobody wants a geoengineering fix more than the oil industry, but they haven't found any that are gonna work. So climate change will continue to kill a bunch of people. It'll continue to make species go extinct. No! Or, we could make the fossil fuel industry go extinct. <laughs>